Welcome back as we wind down this Saturday trip along the road to the Final Four powered by Pontiac. Coming up, nine hours of nonstop tournament action begins with Xavier challenging number one seed Ohio State. That's followed by Butler against Maryland and Louisville versus Texas A&M. At about 530 Eastern, Vanderbilt will clash with Washington State. Boston College meets Georgetown. VCU squares off against Pittsburgh. And at about 8 Eastern tonight, Indiana faces UCLA. Michigan State battles top seed North Carolina. But first up, Xavier and Ohio State. It's almost useless to ask you if you think Ohio State's going to prevail because you always say yes. Yeah, I do feel like Ohio State will prevail. Actually, I think most of the higher seeds will prevail today. Ohio State is versatile enough to deal with Xavier's perimeter attack and then the presence of Greg Oden. When you have a player like that, that can be the difference in this kind of a game. Although I think the environment's going to be electric. I mean, it's in Lexington, Cincinnati only an hour away, a couple hours away, and then Ohio State's got fans that'll be there as well. Since we took those buses away from him, I will reiterate, I think that VCU <laughs> is going to beat Pittsburgh because they uh, win the Tempo War. I like Texas A&M to handle Louisville. Indiana UCLA to me is a very interesting game. So DJ like White could be very dangerous, but I will take the UCLA uh, I'm going to go with UCLA as well. The only upset that I potentially see, Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth is a very intriguing team because they've got excellent backcourt players. Maynard, Pelarosa, B.A. Walker. Where they can get hurt is inside. Now, I wonder if the pace of that game is going to be such that Aaron Gray will have to sit down, but Pitt has the ability to play fast or slow. But I think the one game to watch is Vanderbilt and Washington State. I love what Washington State does in controlling the place, pace and playing defense, but Vanderbilt is one of the best playmaking and shooting teams in the tournament, and I'm pick? taking Vanderbilt we haven't because of their about, offensive ability. We haven't talked about the other number one seed in action later on this evening, and that's North Carolina taking on Michigan State. Well, Michigan State was very impressive defensively. Of course, they got a lot of help from Marquette, but they bring a lot of physical toughness to the floor that Carolina's going to have to deal with. The reason why I like the Tar Heels is because they're only going to need to play well for certain uh, small-minute stretches, and then, you know, when they go on those spurts, you know, they're, they're really going to score a lot exactly. of points. Exactly. Michigan State doesn't have enough offensive firepower. They're going to have to play close to a perfect game in order to keep it manageable and have a chance. But I think Carolina is going to overwhelm I like overwhelm Washington State over Vandy, by the way. And I'll there's this old-time Big East matchup between B.C. and Georgetown. I like the Hoyas. Too much balance. Too Hoyas. much Hoyas. All right. Number nine, Xavier, in top seed Ohio State, set to open the second round down in Lexington. Gus Johnson and Dan Bonner are standing by to call the action. We have all kinds of action slated for you today. Will Doring, join Gus and Dan courtside after this word from your local station. Enjoy the games, everyone. Another round of madness about to unfold here on CBS. The serenity of Kentucky horse country will soon be shattered on the road to the final four ohio state xavier in a battle for the buckeye state to the basket again and he hits it oh 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 crunch time in the heart of basketball country ohio state xavier it's not only business it's personal You're looking live at legendary Rupp Arena where this place is rocking already. Number one Ohio State against number nine Xavier for a trip to the Sweet 16. The winner to take on the winner of Virginia, Tennessee. Hi everybody, I'm Gus Johnson and welcome to Rupp where after 23 years, Xavier finally gets its shot at taking down Ohio State. Only 100 miles separate these two schools and there's no secret, there is a lot of bad blood between them. This will be only their fourth meeting since 1933. Xavier says Ohio State won't play them. The Buckeyes say you're absolutely right, we don't have to, it doesn't serve us. All the talking can stop right now. I'm joined by my partner, Dan Bonner. Danny, a lot of X's and O's to pay attention to in this one. Absolutely, Gus, and in this case, let's do O's and X's. The O being Mr. Greg Oden from Ohio State. And why is he the biggest factor in the game? Well, he's the most dominating player in college basketball. An opponent catches the ball, and the first question is, where is he? As you can see right here, he doesn't even have to make the play to be part of the play. And what's the X? Well, the X is the X for Xavier. And the number is...
there's three. There are three seniors who have been to the Elite Eight, and then the three-point shooting. They've got to make them. And maybe our math will say three plus three equals Sweet 16. All right, coming up, Ohio State, Xavier will have the starting lineups and the opening tip right after this. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the Men's Basketball Championship is sponsored by State Farm. Degree. Coke Zero. And by Pontiac. Here are four plays selected for the Pontiac game-changing performance. With the score tied and five seconds remaining, VCU's Eric Maynard delivered the game winner that eliminated Duke. Winthrop's Craig Bradshaw had 24 points against Notre Dame, including this three that sent the Eagles on a 13-2 run and eventual victory. In the first overtime of this year's tournament, Nevada's Ramon Sessions hit this layup with under a minute to play to seal the Wolfpack's win over Creighton. And Texas freshman Kevin Durant scored 27 against New Mexico State. Go to NCAAsports.com slash Pontiac now to vote for your favorite play. Pontiac will donate $5,000 to the winning school's general scholarship fund. And that school will become eligible for the $100,000 Pontiac game-changing performance of the tournament. Welcome back to Rupp Arena. 23,000 strong in attendance. It's a sellout and a full house. Gus Johnson along with Dan Bonner. Let's take a look at the lineups. Ohio State, Xavier, and take a look. Drew Lavender, he's their point guard, the transfer from Oklahoma. He's the catalyst. He has to play well if Xavier wants to win this game. On the other side, the mighty Odin, Greg Odin, against Central Connecticut State in the first round. 19 points, 10 rebounds. He was 7 of 10 from the free throw line. Sean Miller, head coach at Xavier. He was an assistant to Thad Mata. When Thad Mata was the head coach at Xavier and led the Musketeers into the Elite Eight, they lost to Duke in Atlanta. Today's game is brought to you in high definition by Harris Corporation, the world leader in broadcast systems for high definition television and mobile media. Xavier, at the beginning of this tournament, said they wanted Ohio State. The Buckeyes say, you want us, you got us. And right now, between these two teams, nothing standing but space and opportunity. Got to be careful what you wish for. And Xavier starts in the man-to-man -man defense. The point guard matchup going to be very impressive today. Here's Connolly, the freshman. Ivan Harris fired. Weak side rebound, and this goes to Burrell. So Xavier coming off a 79-77 win over BYU. In the first round, Justin Goldman with 23-5 and five on 8 of 17 shooting in 33 minutes. He's got a Larry Bird light release on his jump shot. Now Cole backing up on Odin. Jump hook. Oh. And Gus, you notice one thing. Ohio State does not help out in the post. Greg Odin plays behind and relies on his shot blocking ability. That was a great move inside by Cole to float it up with the left hand. Buckeyes are the number one team in the nation. Number one seed in the South. Odin power dribble gets to the cup. Halfway down, pops out. Snatched out of there by Cade. Xavier running now. Burrell scoreless against BYU the other day. Inside, Cole off the glass. Maybe a little too easy. He was against Harris that time. Odin calling for it again. Mike Conley. And this is the Iceman for them. Jamar Butler, such a strong, confident, quiet player. Lewis, counter. And Ohio State can kill you with that. Both Butler and Lewis are guys who can hit big three-point shots. Ohio State much more than Mike Conley and Greg Oden. Now Ohio State getting back. They're playing a zone. Play a 2-3 zone. Mostly a man-to-man -man team, but they do play some zone. That allows Oden to wander in the middle. He's not tied down to one guy. Dolman is the zone buster. He fires. And halfway down pops out. But with Odin in the middle of the zone, we could see it from where we were sitting. Goldman had to put a little bit of extra arc on that shot. Now Goldman, outlet to Lavender. He's great in transition. Straight to the bucket. Rejected. Picked up by Lewis. He's got Connolly. Connolly beats Goldman. Mike Connolly Jr. One of the great young point guards in all of college basketball. His father, Mike Conley Sr., a great long jumper and triple jumper, gold medalist in Barcelona in 1992. It's 
Skip pass, Burrell. They need his offense today. Loose ball ripped out of there. Up strong and in. And that's Justin Cage. We talked before the game about the three seniors for Xavier, the guys who are on that run to the Elite Eight. Cole and Cage and Dolman, and both Cole and Cage have scored so far in this game. Xavier stays in the man-to-man. -man. Cole trying to keep Odin as far from the basket as possible. And Lewis knocks one down off the dribble. Ron Lewis, a transfer from Bowling Green, gives Ohio State a 7-4 lead. You cannot afford to play off Lewis and Butler out on the perimeter. You have to make them drive the ball to the basket. Xavier, a team that really relies a lot on motion. Sometimes you play a zone to prevent that motion. Lewis with the rebound. So, so far, Xavier starting slowly, two of seven from the field. Here's Conley. Early shooting. Ohio State at 50%. Odin wants it. Has great position. Draws a double team and a foul. Greg Odin. Well, Ohio State it does such a nice job in transition. Here, Odin isn't even the play. That's Ivan Harris who blocks the shot, and that's just like a turnover because Ohio State takes it out, particularly with Conley, pushes it down the court, and Lewis, a deadly finisher at the end of the break. Goldman picks up the foul. The strategy is obviously thus far to attack Greg Odin when he has the ball, force him to make decisions. Josh Duncan in the game. Odin backs up on him. Can't bank it in. Loose ball. Batted around. No. Odin picks it up. Has it swiped out of his hands. And Xavier kicks it out of bounds. But they're running a lot of different guys from different angles at Odin already. 15-51 to go. Ohio State up 7-4. An exclusive interview with Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. His first network one-on-one -on, -one on Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer. Sunday. Welcome back, Thad Mata. What a great season he's had. 31-3 and at Ohio State, number one team in the nation. For three years, he was the head coach at Xavier. Led the team to the Elite Eight in 2004. Lost to Duke by three points in Atlanta. But there's a lot of bad blood between these two squads because Coach Mata said he was going to stay at Xavier one day. The next day, he signed with Ohio State. And the Xavier fans haven't forgotten what took place. <laughs> the Xavier fans, every time they see Thad Mata here in this building, they've booed him so far. Won 26 games for three straight years. Now Odin posting up. Xavier stays in the man-to-man. -man. Across the lane. Can't get it to fall. Batted around. Picked up by Lavender. Here comes Lavender in transition. Down the lane. Lavender, the runner, rims off. If Xavier's going to have a chance to win this game, Gus, they have to make shots like that. They've missed a couple of those transition runners, and all that allows Ohio State to do is get the ball out and go the other way. Lewis to the basket. And he's off to a good start. Ron Lewis with seven points. You miss in transition on one end. You give Ohio State an opportunity in transition on the other. 9-4. Ohio State stays in the zone. I don't think that model liked the results of that first play where they threw it inside to Cole and he scored easily against the man to man. Xavier has won 10 of their last 11 games. They fell to Rhode Island in the Atlantic 10 semifinals. Shot clock down, Burrell deep in the corner, short. No rhythm so far for Xavier. In the front court, Butler. No fire from there. Duncan with the rebound. Inside, nice play. And there's the transition. You get in transition, you beat Odin down the court. Justin Cage makes it a 9-6 game. He has four. Now Odin in the high post. Odin, jump hook. Off the heel and a foul. So far, Odin having some problems getting it to stay down. He's 0 for 4. One of the things that helps, here's Odin. Here's the ball coming down the court. You want to get the ball down the court before Odin gets there. Nice job in transition by Xavier. And they've struggled in the half court offense. Odin now going out, he struggled offensively early. Dad Mata really lobbying the referees hard. Thinks Odin is being fouled on the inside. 
The officiating has been terrific in this tournament and all season in college basketball because they are allowing these players, especially the big guys, to play and be physical with each other. Back door. Bam. Derek Brown. One of the most explosive young players in all of college basketball. And Ohio State lead, its lead has been cut to one. Connolly the teardrop. No. Duncan going in, and there's a foul. You talked about Derek Brown. This kid is a fabulous leaper, and if you can't go through the zone, well, go over it. Odin goes out of the game, so he's not a factor, so you feel comfortable throwing the ball up to a great leaper. And Derek Brown from Dayton, Ohio, Chaminade Juliet High School had eight points and 16 rebounds in 16 minutes versus BYU. Six of those rebounds, offensive rebounds. So he will attack the glass. Right at the moment, his offensive move consists of a dunk, but when you jump <laughs> like he can and get great position, that's enough. Raymond to Burrell, 10 to shoot. Duncan inside. Brown kicks it out. Duncan, he can shoot it. And halfway down, it comes out. Off the glass. Ohio State the other way. Xavier's done a really nice job on their defensive board so far. Stay in the man-to-man. -man. To Williger in the game on the baseline. Short. Tipped up. Hunter. Can't get it. Tracked down. Burrell. Burrell averages 13 a game. Duncan, this time he sets his feet. Both teams shooting poorly to start. Xavier 4 of 13. Ohio State 4 of 14. So much emotion in a game like this, though, Gus. It takes teams a while to get, get, the, get sort of calmed down and just start playing basketball. The jitters. Daquan Cook, great offensive player. Can't make it down. Snatched out of there by Duncan. Here's Lavin. He's from Columbus. Rise and fire. Conley the other way. <laughs> and we'll stay right here. Tight game so far. Both teams nervous. 11.46 to play in the first half. Ohio State up by a penny. You talk about some excitement, Gus. Conley in transition is about as much fun as you can possibly have watching a basketball game. See what fans have to say or tell us why your team is the best. Post up now at CSTV.com. CSTV, the 24-hour college sports network from CBS Sports. All right, let's take a look at the tournament summary. And it's a tournament that has been very interesting for the lack of upsets. And that, you know, the higher seeds, uh, it's been the number nine seed beating the number eight seed is the most common upset, and you really can't consider that to be much of an upset. Here's Oden on the baseline. Now Butler stops. Xavier has been in the man to man throughout. Cook. Neither team able to buy a basket. Ohio State 4 17, Xavier 4 14. Now Wolf comes in to run the point. For the Musketeers. And now High State back to the man-to-man -man coming out of the timeout. And a whistle. Foul coming up on Lighty. That's his first. Dolman checks in and he replaces Derek Brown. Just keep an eye on the fouls because Xavier does a great job getting to the free throw line and converting at the free throw line. Xavier, a 74% free throw shooting team on the season, Dan. They were 23 of 29 against BYU in the first round here on Thursday. So you're absolutely right. Raymond. Dolman backs it up, 17 to shoot. Looking inside, lets it fly. Raymond got a hand on it, but can't track it down. Cook is there, but he steps on the sideline. Out of bounds. Dolman is an excellent three-point shooter, Gus. That shot might have been one step out of his range, and he was shooting it over the outstretched hand of Greg Oden. And as we talked about Oden before, he makes a difference, even if he doesn't get his hand on the ball. Both these teams tight to start this game. They haven't met since 1984 in the NIT. 
Xavier winning that game, so it's been 23 years. They've met three times since 1933. Inside, nice catch, Cage. 12 to shoot, backs it up. Now Wolf with the step on the baseline. Short, oh. and he gets the bounce. Now, first of all, the rims here are great. <laughs> well, if you're a shooter, I think if you're a defensive guy, you don't think that's so good, but absolutely, Gus, for fans watching the game, you like to see those rims that allow the bounce. Six unanswered points for Xavier. 10-9. And a whistle and a foul. Tomorrow on CBS, a detective discovers his wife's killer on a new episode of Cold Case starring Katherine Morris. Tomorrow at 9, 8 central on CBS. That's what we have going on here, Gus, a cold case. <laughs> that's right. Ohio State over their last eight from the field. Ron Lewis checks back in. Oh, that's an offensive foul. So Greg Oden getting a little frustrated. He's only a freshman. And the interesting thing about Greg Oden is he very rarely does this. He's very patient when he gets the ball inside, but very clearly lowers his shoulder. And he picked up his first foul. Now Dolman. Raymond, he can hit it. It's that zone again. It looks like Ohio State's in the zone when Lavender's in the game. Xavier getting good looks at the basket. They just can't convert. Jump hook Oden rattles home. And that's one reason why Ohio State won't stay cold. They have the option. They can win the inside and get some points. Greg Oden leads the Buckeyes in scoring, rebounding, and block shots. Goldman can't track the ball down. Oden does a great job getting position inside. And then you can't double team if he's going to shoot that jump hook so quickly. Nice recovery by Oden. He has a very good demeanor out on the court. That foul call, he, he doesn't lose his head. He's, he has a very, very good approach to the game. Now Conley, stripped by Lavender. Lavender, cross town traffic to the bucket, leaves it. How about that? Cage. I thought he took it too far, Gus. I thought he was going to try to shoot it, and Odin was right there, but he knew better than I. He, was, he saw it when Odin got to him and then passed it behind. Cage with six. Lavender is the key to this team. Conley blocked by Dolman. Picked up. Hunter dumps it down, and Conley banks it home. Ohio State back up. Bounce pass, Cage, and he's fouled from behind. Great ball movement by the Musketeers. And they're doing a much better job against the zone, and Drew Lavender thus far in this game, his quickness has sort of neutralized the quickness of Mike Conlon. Here he waits till Odin comes, gets Odin off his feet, and then makes the pass. Even Odin isn't quick enough to recover from that. So Cage at the line. He's a senior from Indianapolis, and this is the first. As you take a look at the free throw shooting this season. Look at how many times Xavier gets to the line as opposed to their opponents, and then they make 74% cage, a 75% free throw shooter. Getting to the line and converting is a big part of the Xavier game. Lewis picked up the foul, his first. Game tied at 13. First half. Ohio State, Xavier playing for a trip to the Sweet 16. It's the Big Ten versus the Atlantic Ten. Now Odin in the pivot. Cage doing a nice job closing on the shooter. Cage has a couple inches on Lewis. Odin oh. And a foul on the floor. Now Odin using his quickness. That's a good point, Gus. You play Odin, you try to be physical with him, you try to put your body up against him, but he's a smart enough player that he can go right around, and that's what he did. He felt that they were pushing him, and he just used that quickness for the spin move. First foul on Duncan. Odin again. Butler from deep. And hits. 
the Iceman. That's great spacing out there by Ohio State. Butler threw the ball inside and then found a good shooting position, one where it'd be hard to recover, and got a wide open shot on the pass from Oden. Butler against Central Connecticut State, 17 points. He was five of six from the three-point line. Lavender. And a whistle and foul. This will go against Lewis, and it's his second. 7.29 to play first half. Ohio State on top of Xavier. 16-13 here in Lexington. Welcome back as we take a look at the game summary. Both of these teams are a little nervous as this one gets ready to start. Gus Johnson along with Dan Bonner and Xavier's still in this game, Danny. You talked about it. They had to hit threes, but they're still in even though they haven't done a good job. You're correct, but I think if they're going to actually come around and win the game, they're going to have to start making threes. They've done a great job on the backboard so far. Very few second chance opportunities for Ohio State. And the Buckeyes get back into that zone. Lavender, Burrell, Dolman. Along with Duncan and Cage, here's Burrell, long jump shot off the mark. Xavier 0 for 7 from the three-point line, 6 of 20 overall, 30%. Now Cook posted. Tough shot. Odin with the offensive rebound. Strong oh. his hands by Lavender. Lavender with numbers. Blocked by Connolly. Great play. Connolly, the outlet pass. Butler lets it go and hits. That is twice now in this game we've seen Xavier have a shot blocked in transition and Ohio State answers. You'd better find Butler beyond that three point line. Jamar Butler. So cold with his game. As you take a look at the bracket, the winner takes on the winner of Virginia, Tennessee. 1913 Buckeyes. Goldman kicks it out reversal Burrell 11 to shoot and he throws it away Duncan Odin in the middle of that zone means you just can't throw it in there and get an easy jump shot Connolly in and out Odin tired now he's having a hard time getting up and down Burrell to the basket and an offensive foul Just a little earlier, we talked about Ohio State and the amount of space. Watch over here on this side of the court. Just two players. Butler throws the ball inside to Odin, and watch how he moves. He moves away from the play so he can get the pass back, and the man can't recover quickly, and he gets a wide open three. So Greg Odin will take a blow. Terwilliger replaces him. Odin leaves. He's one of five from the field. Two points, two rebounds. And a whistle away from the ball. I think and we'll go against Brown. Yeah, yes. Derek Brown. And Derek Brown is on the floor. Good things happen. Oh, they sure do. This young man, the folks at Xavier think he may be the next big star at Xavier. And they've had some big ones in the past. David West, Jermaine Sato, Lionel James, Chalmers, James Posey. James Posey, exactly. Ivan Harris can really shoot the basketball when he's in rhythm. Terwilliger, good passer. Butler kicks it out. Cook. Daquan Cook has really struggled with his shot lately. Yeah, over the last seven or eight games, his number's not very good. Only averaging about five points. He's out of Dayton Dunbar High School. Now Odin out of the game, so they switch back to the man-to-man. -man. Should be some... Penetration opportunities now for Lavender. Runs a pick and roll. Dolman, he's been very quiet. Off the dribble now. Strong to the bucket. On that elite, basket for Dolman. On that Elite Eight team that we talked about, Dolman was a freshman and he was sort of a designated three point shooter, but as his career has gone on, he's developed a complete game. Can't make that driving move though with Odin in the game. The season high 29 against Rhode Island. Now Conley really working that in and out dribble. Really worked that screen effectively. Lavender tried, but he just wasn't able to get around. 
Dolman dumps it down. Brown and a whistle and foul on the baseline. Aerial coverage of today's game is brought to you by Goodyear. Talk about Mike Conley and his ability with the basketball. He's so quick. He, he appeared to be going the one way, and Lavender went that way, and then guy actually got caught up with his own man, and Conley came back the other way. Second foul called on Ohio State's Terwilliger as Brown goes to the line. Derek Brown, a freshman from Dayton, shoots 70 percent from the field. He came into this tournament 73 of 104. Greg Oden returns. He's explosive, and he brings a lot of energy off the bench. Second one goes down, and a timeout on the floor. 4:31 to play in the first half. 21-17. Ohio State on top of Xavier. Look out! What a finish! A tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. Buckeyes with the 21-17 lead over Xavier here in the first half. Sean Miller, Thad Mata, they're not just friends, they're best friends. Thad Mata saying that Sean is my best friend in life. They coached together at Miami of Ohio, rather, as assistants under Herb Sendick in 1995, sharing an office. And when Sean came to Xavier, he didn't have a place to live for a month, so he, his wife Amy, his two kids, and his child on the way all stayed at Coach Mata's house for that month. So very difficult for both these young coaches to face each other this afternoon. And one of the difficulties with their players facing off, Gus, is each guy knows the other one's philosophy and way of thinking intimately. Makes it hard to pull any surprises. Now Odin inside. Turn around. Jump shot. No good. But he's fouled on the play. If you're going to double team Odin or any other big guy, Gus, you got to get there before he dribbles the ball. You can't be slapping at it once the ball's in his hands after the dribble. For Greg Odin, <laughs> he can use his right hand or he can use his left hand. Pretty efficient with both as he hits the first free throw. The amazing thing about that, Gus, and this story has been told before, but I, it's so impressive, I'll tell it again. He never in his life even practiced a left-handed free throw before August of this year. And yet he was able to do it well enough that he got and shoot 62% with his offense. Great rotation on his release. Dolman picked up his second foul as Odin hits the free throws and heads to the bench. Terwilliger is back in. 23-17. Xavier trying to get some balls to stay down for him. 7 of 22 from the field. 0 for 7 from the three-point line. Wolf. For the most part, their inside opportunities have been lobs over the zone when Odin's not in the game for transition baskets. Inside, Cole creates space and a foul. That is precisely the kind of play that has not been available when Odin is in the game. 23-19 now. Cole will go to the line. Working hard against the zone. Discover, friends, you never knew you had. Win an NCAA men's Final Four trip for two only at MyCokeRewards.com slash NCAA. Rupp Arena, Lexington, Kentucky, 347 to play in the first half. Ohio State with the 23-19 lead. Greg Oden, so far on the afternoon, four points, three rebounds as Cole misses the free throw. Been a herky-jerky first half. Really has been. Nobody able to get any offensive rhythm. Well, it's a good battle inside between Cole and Odin. Cook, nice look. Hunter gets the roll. Wait a minute, basket interference is the call. Looks like Odin may have interfered with the ball as it hung on the rim. And Thad Mata can't believe it. That's one of the best facial expressions of the tournament. 
<laughs> and the Musketeers turn it over. Conley. Four turnovers for Xavier, five for Ohio State. Now Oden posting Duncan. Butler, quick release. See if Xavier can get a good shot here. This zone has been a problem. Now they go into the man-to-man. -man. With Odin in the game, though, Xavier just hasn't been able to get anything close to the basket. Duncan steps back and hits. And that is critical. Duncan is a guy who can be a very, very effective outside shooter. If he makes that basket consistently, that pulls Odin away, and that really helps the Musketeers. He came into this tournament shooting 38% from the three-point line, 37 of 97, and traveling violation against Cook. But let's go back to the basket interference a couple of plays ago. Well, this is a tough, tough thing where the guy guarding Odin has to come and help, and he looked like he really did get his fingertips on it while it was on the rim. He also appeared to know it and try to pull away at the last second without much success. 23-22. Back to the zone. If you're Xavier, this is where you want to be. Absolutely. You haven't shot the ball well, and amazingly enough, you're only down one point with two minutes to go. The chance to take the lead here. Burrell on the baseline, and he's pushed. Hunter pushes it. And don't forget, coming up at halftime, our crew in New York will break it down for you. Greg Gumbel, Clark Kellogg, and Seth Davis, Tournament News, DJ and Daryl, and also a Naismith watch update. Burrell at the line. Stanley Burrell, the junior from Indianapolis. He was 0 for 4 against BYU. Misses the free throw. When uncharacteristically, Xavier struggling from the free throw line today. They're only six. Yeah. Conley and a foul. And Mike Conley, really the catalyst that gets this Ohio State offense going. He's a point guard. He gets the ball where it's supposed to go. He can steal it, and he's great at penetrating to the basket. Mike Conley Jr. led the Big Ten in assists, steals, and an assist to turnover ratio. As he hits the first, he's a 65% free throw shooter. There's his dad, Mike Conley Sr., the Olympian gold medalist. Mike Conley Jr., the first Ohio State player ever with 200 assists in a season. And that is unbelievable. Only a freshman. Duncan picked up his second foul, 25-22. Buckeyes get back into the zone. And the zone, again, allows Odin to stay close to the basket. He doesn't have to go outside to guard guys like Duncan. Nice look, Duncan, and he missed the layup. That's the presence of Greg Oden right there. He caught the ball, and he was thinking, where is he? Butler from deep. Kept alive by Hunter, and tapped up and in by Oden. That has to be a huge concern for Xavier. They have not given up very many offensive rebounds, but with Hunter and Oden both in the game at the same time, it's hard to keep the Buckeyes off the board. Under a minute to go. Duncan lets it fly and hits. That's a problem. He was too close to the basket. <laughs> Move well, him out a little bit. And he knew Odin was under the basket, so he didn't have to deal with that. That is a huge basket by Duncan. Ohio State appeared to be on one of their patented runs, and that's how you stop a run. You put the ball in the goal. Duncan had the big layup against BYU to give the Musketeers a 77-75 lead. Xavier now in a 1-3-1 trap here. 
Shot clock, game clock about the same. Butler. You don't want him just to hold the ball for the last shot. Seven to shoot. Conley down the lane. The runner. No! And it goes up and in. Looks like it may have been basket interference. Not this time. The call's always even out in the end. And that's the end of the first half. Ohio State with a 29-25 lead. Let's take another look at that last basket. Very difficult to use something like a 1-3-1 trap against Mike Conley. Just takes the ball hard to the basket. And there's that offensive rebounding again. That is a tough, tough call. I'm glad I'm not the one who has to make it. Looks like he did touch it. 29-25. We'll send you to Greg Gumbel with AT&T at the half after this message and a word from your local station. You're watching CBS Sports, home of the men's NCAA Basketball Championship. Sports presents AT&T at the half. Singular is now the new AT&T. Hi, everyone. I'm Greg Gumbel. Welcome to AT&T at the half. After 20 minutes of second round tournament play in Lexington, Ohio State with a four-point lead on Xavier. I am joined by Clark Kellogg and Seth Davis. Let's talk about this first half, particularly Mr. Odin. Well, Odin struggled early on. Xavier doing a nice job backing into him getting a lot of bodies around him and when you take a look at his shot opportunities he's in the lane but he misses a couple of point blank shots some of that's good defense he being distracted but very aggressive and bodying up Greg Oden and he missed his first four finally he got one to go down late but picked up a foul as well so I think Xavier's doing a really nice job trying to make it tough for Greg Oden to it, get clean looks in the paint. If you're a musketeer, you're going, my kingdom for three. That's right. And you're, very, you're feeling very fortunate to only be down four yeah. points at this point, given how poorly they're shooting the basketball. We know that Oden is going to get his inside. But how about the second best three-point shooting team in the Atlantic 10 going two for nine, including zero for their first seven. Drew Lavender is sixth in the conference in three-point shooting, and he is 0 for 2. Xavier's doing a very good job attacking Ohio State on both sides of the ball, but at some point, you have to make shots that if they don't heat up, they will not win. Yeah, and if somebody, if, if, if Odin isn't carrying the Buckeyes, someone has to do it. Yeah, they've got some experienced backcourt players, primarily Jamar Butler and Ron Lewis, throw in freshman Mike Conley Jr., and those three have combined for 23 of the 29. Transition three, that's wet. Here's Conley. Shifty, nifty, right to the rim. And the Buckeyes have that kind of balance. Greg Oden's not going to continue to miss those kind of shots that he missed in the first half, and you always have to worry about the Buckeyes going on a roll from the perimeter. you got to think Xavier's not going to continue to miss those threes right. in well the second said. half, well too. Said. Coming up next at 3.20 Eastern time, second-round play gets underway in Buffalo, where Butler takes on Maryland in a Midwest region matchup. The Terps are led by senior swingman D.J. Strawberry, whose father, Darrell, was an all-star outfielder better known for squandering his enormous potential. DJ has taken a different path, hoping to follow in his dad's shoes as an athlete while avoiding all of the high-profile missteps. I'm DJ Strawberry, son of Daryl Strawberry. Great steal by the ever-present Strawberry. I'm Daryl Strawberry, father of DJ Strawberry. My style of play is slashing to the basket, hard-nosed defense, just playing with a lot of energy and a lot of passion. I think he has the same type of energy that I have, a go-get-it type of energy, not afraid to fail, and, and that's a pretty good sign when you're not afraid to fail. My greatest memories of DJ growing up as a kid was when I was playing and he was at Shea Stadium, he was always coming down to that front row, and look, look on his little face, you know. I thought for sure I had me another uh, junior playing baseball, but um, it kind of fooled me and went in a different direction. Strawberry jams it home. We got a good father-son relationship. He's just great. He's always there for me. He's always supportive of me. He comes to my games and, you know, he, want, he wants the best for me. Our relationship is great. You know, as a father figure and being in the public eyes as such as I was, I kind of stay out of the way. I'm not one of those fathers that hover over him and brag about it and say, yeah, that's my son or anything to that nature because I wanted him to learn on his own what it was like, you know, being DJ Strawberry. And I'm so grateful that he chose basketball because he was able to separate himself away from baseball and not have to hear, are you going to be as great as your dad was? When I came to Maryland, I just wanted to, you know, 
make my own name for myself. And at first, my dad being around would probably put a lot of more attention on him than, than it would on me. And I, I wanted to be known as DJ Strawberry, the basketball player, and not Daryl Strawberry's son for the rest of my life. Life, life, life. Daryl Strawberry has admitted having a substance abuse problem. I'm an addict, and I go out, and I use drugs. He's been in and out of rehab programs, jails, and courtrooms. I've always told DJ, every bad decision you make and every choice that you make that's wrong, there's consequences behind it. Don't make the mistakes I've made. I've told him the truth about me, you know, and, and that's the most important thing. And that's all you can tell your kids. You live, you learn. It was very difficult just because when you're in high school or when you're in middle school, you know, kids talk. And it, it gets real frustrating sometimes, but, you know, it, it makes you grow up fast. During that time, I was just kind of disappointed that he would put himself in that situation and, you know, not use his talents to, to his greatest ability. My journey was a different journey, and I surely don't want DJ or any other of my kids to have to go on the journey that I had to go on. You realize as a parent that you, your decisions don't only affect you, they affect your children. And I know they had a huge effect on him because of the fact he's an athlete. And, you know, you're going to get targeted when you're an athlete, and, and your dad has been, you know, in the public eyes, and, and things have happened, and things are said. I think the most important thing, he's, he's overcome all that, and, you know, he was able to focus and went out and had him a, a great college career. That wish does not destroy you. Only makes you stronger. I hear the Daryl chants and all that, you know. Uh, that's been going on since high school. I think it's just funny now, you know. People are still using the same chants and trying to get in my head. It, it, it's all fun and games to me. I, I, I love playing on the road. I love going on the road and, you know, uh, proving people wrong and, you know, just looking at the crowd when it's all over and, you know, we got the win. I told him a part of putting on the uniform and being an athlete that you know, fans are going to be fans, and if you learn to stand under that pressure and play under that pressure, then you're able to excel at another level, then it doesn't affect you. Senior day was a very emotional day for me, not only because of his athletic skills, but because of, you know, not having to hear his name in any negative press through four years of college. That was a very touching moment for me. All the emotions there, you know, my dad was real emotional, my mom, you know, they were just so proud of me of uh, how far I've come along and how I've played this season. You know, that's the proud moment when you can look at it and say, hey, my kid has done something very special and he's done it the right way. Looks like we can rest assured DJ is headed in the right direction. How are DJ and company going to handle Butler? Well, I tell you what, when you think about DJ Strawberry and what he brings to the table from a defensive standpoint, from a perseverance and attitude standpoint, his effort today will be key in determining how Maryland does because he's going to have to match up with some guys that can shoot that three-point shot and A.J. Graves and a few other Butler players. Ar arguably the best on-the-ball defender in college basketball, certainly one of the toughest players in college basketball. And what has really helped D.J. Strawberry's development is when he had to fill in at the point guard spot because of injury issues in the past. Now you bring in Grievous Vasquez, the exciting freshman uh, to play that position. He's a better ball handler. He's improved his shooting. Maryland is going to beat Butler. All right, guys, once again, D.J. and the Terps in action against Butler in our next set of games. And uh, those next set of games include Louisville and Texas A&M. Should be a dandy in the South region. All of that still to come today. AT&T at the half continues in just a moment. Welcome back, everyone. Time now for another installment of the Naismith Watch presented by AT&T. You can't include a group without including AC Law. You certainly can't, partner. This guy has been terrific all season long. Big time shot maker, big time playmaker, 18 points a game. He is splendid. And most importantly, he's a guy who does it when his team needs it most. They call him Captain Clutch for good reason. Text the word vote to 87654 on your AT&T or singular wireless phone to register. Voting for the 2007 Naismith Trophy winner begins when the four finalists are announced tomorrow afternoon. Now, games still to come later on this evening include Vanderbilt, Washington State, BC, Georgetown, and Virginia Commonwealth against Pittsburgh. And then we wrap up later on with Indiana, UCLA, and Michigan State, North Carolina. I know you guys are just chomping at the bit on the VCU pit game. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Contrasting styles, the perimeter play of VCU outstanding across the board. Will Pittsburgh be able to play small ball if necessary, or will they be able to establish Aaron Gray inside and allow him to dominate the paint? I just think VCU has some of that 
that George Mason magic oh. dust from last year. It just seems that things are breaking their way, and they're making their outside shots, which has been a question mark. And I think Washington State was really impressive in their first-round win, even though I thought Oral Roberts might take it. But they got terrific uh, production from a lot of different players. And Taylor Rochester, you don't hear a lot about him. He's the transfer from Tulane. Greg got healthy towards the end of the year. He's given them a big offensive Watch out for Derek Byers and Shane Foster for Vanderbilt. All right, guys, thank you for joining us on AT&T at the half. We'll get you back to Gus and Dan for the second half of Xavier and Ohio State after this. CBS Sports presents AT&T at the half. Singular is now the new AT&T. Phil Mickelson, the champion, 2006 at Augusta. A tradition unlike any other, the Masters on CBS. Halftime in Lexington, Ohio State with the lead. Vote for your Pontiac game-changing performance of each round. Nearly $150,000 of scholarship contributions is on the line. Vote now at NCAAsports.com slash Pontiac. And now here is the in-game box score provided by CSTV. But first of all, the Odin factor. We talked about this before the game, Gus. Odin is in the middle of your screen. Now, he's actually going to go to the corner. Josh Duncan comes in. He's expecting Odin to be there. He misses the shot. And on the other end, Odin, one of his two offensive rebounds. He's got six points in the game thus far to go along with five rebounds. And now we're ready for our in-game box score, powered by CSTV, the 24-hour college sports channel from CBS. As we look at that box score, Gus, the big factor, look at Burrell and Lavender, the starting backcourt for Xavier, zero points. Conley Lewis Butler, the starting backcourt for Ohio State, 23 points, so 23 to zero starting backcourts. 29-25, Buckeyes with the lead at the break. Coming up the second half from Lexington. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the Men's Basketball Championship is sponsored by BF Goodrich Tires, Miller Lite, Vonage, and by Chevrolet. Welcome back to Rupp Arena. Tight game here, 29-25, Ohio State with the lead. Gus Johnson along with Dan Bonner, and welcome back to Rupp. And Danny, Xavier is still in this basketball game, and they haven't hit any shots. They really haven't, but what they have been able to do is they've held Ohio State to only 35% shooting. But right at the moment, Gus, they're like the little Dutch boy. They got the finger in the <laughs> hole in the dike, but there's other holes starting to sprout out. They've got to start making some baskets. All right, Greg Oden in the first half, six points, five rebounds, one foul. And those, uh, those other holes in the dike, Gus, are the offensive rebounding. Ohio State really picked it up in the last couple of minutes of the half using their inside power. The only way Xavier can counter that is to make shots. Dolman inside. Turnaround fadeaway. Got it. He's the key for Xavier. Justin Dolman, their leading scorer, averages 13 a game. He has four now. Also, Stanley Burrell was scoreless against BYU. He continues to struggle. Burrell scoreless in this game. You have to figure that eventually he'll get a couple to go. Well, certainly Sean Miller hopes so because he told me yesterday they could not win if Burrell did not score. Now Burrell on the wing, guarded by Butler. Pick and roll, heads down the lane, throws it away. I think in that situation, guys, you have to attack Odin. Five turnovers for Xavier. Harris a three. Off the mark. Odin with the offensive rebound. Leans in, can't get it to fall. No call. Lavender pushing it. The kick. Dolman straight away. Pure. These are the Musketeers that we saw on Thursday. Dolman now with seven. Xavier up by a penny. Connolly poked out of his hands from behind. And it's last touch by Xavier. Odin does a great job getting position inside, and nobody drops their arms, Gus. Everybody keeps their arms up in the air so they don't swat at the ball. And as a result, Odin misses the shot, and there's no foul. Now that's a foul. A holding foul called 
Cole grabbing the back of Odin's jersey. And he picks up his first. First foul against Xavier in the second half. Sometimes if you're a big guy inside, you can get away with using your body. As long as you don't put that knee out there, but you're never going to get away with hacking down with your arms, and that's what Cole did that time. Lewis, Butler, Odin, Harris, Connolly for the Buckeyes. Lewis. Connolly backs it up. Drives, taken away by Lavender, but he steps on the baseline out of bounds. Mike Conley Jr. has had all kinds of problems with Lavender. Lavender's defensive quickness has been remarkable tonight. Lavender does a great job watching when Conley exposes the basketball and knocking it away. But you know what? Conley doesn't mind. He keeps going after him. He's not worried by one bad play. He goes and gets the next play. Great defense by Burrell as Butler turns it over. Seven turnovers for Ohio State. Now Lavender, Goldman, Burrell. Cole, Cage, Cole inside, blocked from behind. And they will tie it up. Possession arrow favoring the Buckeyes. Okay, maybe it's not a good idea to attack Odin inside. Here they try to do that. Pass inside and a very quick move by Cole. I'm sure he thought he had room, but that's why old Odin is back there in the center of that zone. Lewis pops out. Short and out of bounds. Near the end of today's game, we'll select a Chevrolet player of the game from each team to honor their determination and outstanding play. Chevrolet will make a $1,000 contribution to each university's general scholarship fund. America's brand supports America's best. Chevy and American Revolution. 30-29 Xavier. The winner of this game advances to the Sweet 16. Goldman fires and hits again. In the second half, Gus, he has caught the ball in the middle of that zone a couple of times now and turned and shot the ball. Not worried at all about Odin. Much different than he played in the first half. Goldman has a very nice mid-range jump shot. Odin, great catch. And one. And now Odin directing traffic with one of his teammates. We talked about Dolman. He was on that, a starter on that Elite Eight team when he was a freshman. Catches the ball inside, goes right over Odin. You cannot play in front of Odin. That's an excellent pass inside. And he's telling his teammates, hey, guys, let's get going. Dolman called for the foul, his third, as Cole has a conversation with Coach Miller. Greg Odin at the line. Free throw short. 32-31 in the front court. Cage driving and a whistle. That'll go on Odin his second. Playing defense with his arms as opposed to sliding with his feet. And Greg Odin picks up his second foul. He's much less intimidating out on the perimeter though, Gus, when you have a chance to go around him. Now Burrell kicks it out. Dolman stripped and fouled. And that's Conley Jr. Picks up his first. We're Duncan in the game now for Xavier. Dolman the inbounder. And he finds Lavender. Dolman's got to be careful with those three fouls. Lots of times you can be cautious on defense, but he puts his head down and tries to drive to the basket. He might pick up a charge. And usually when Xavier starts getting going, it's Lavender that leads him on the baseline, out of bounds. Cage. As Miller looks, six turnovers for Xavier. Ohio State was back in the man-to-man -man that time, and Lavender was trying to get the ball to Cage to beat Odin. The winner of this game takes on the winner of Virginia, Tennessee. Now Butler, stop and start. And banks it in. Ice. He has eight. In the corner. Cage from deep. Count it. 
Justin Cage. And he gives Xavier a 35-33 lead. Conley pulls up right hand jump hook no loose knocked out of bounds and will stay right here everybody talks about Butler's ability to shoot the three but he can drive to the basket ten guys from Xavier have made threes this year cage today Fifteen fifty nine to play in the second half Xavier on top of Ohio State right now and this is a special meeting for Drew Lavender and Ron Lewis. They're both from Columbus. They both played at Brookhaven High School in Columbus for coach Bruce Howard won the state title in 2002. They go off into the world. Lavender goes to Oklahoma. Lewis goes to Bowling Green. Lavender transfers to Xavier. Lewis transfers to Ohio State. Now the former teammates are meeting each other here with a chance to go to the Sweet 16. Lewis's shot blocked. Burrell with a chance to get an easy one. Comes up short. Now 0 for 8 in the NCAA tournament. Lewis and he's fouled. So Ron Lewis will go to the line. Gus want to take a second here to wish our very best to Dave Gavitt former Providence coach and Big East Commissioner he was here at this site working for NCA radio and got sick a upper respiratory infection they took him to the hospital we understand he's doing fine he's probably watching the game we just want to pass along our best wishes Lewis at the line makes the first foul was called on Duncan his third here come the subs and I talked to Lewis before the game. He said that he and Lavender had a chance to talk before the game, actually last night, and that they were looking forward to playing against each other. But you have to think that Coach Bruce Howard, who passed away two years after that team won the state championship at Brookhaven in 2002, Coach Howard must be hovering around somewhere, <laughs> really happy about what he's seeing, his guys playing. The two great schools in this big game. And Ohio State goes back to the man to man. Game tied at 35. Foul problems really an issue now for Xavier with both Duncan and Dolman on the bench. Some outside scoring power gone. Lavender leaves it inside. Protected by O. And Rome comes up with the rebound. Here come the Bucks. Butler, short, batted around. Who wants it? And a foul on the floor. Going against Brown. The mighty Odin taking over. He is such a force on the inside. Now that time Lavender thought he had Odin. Odin came to him, but did you see how quickly Odin came down, turned around, blocked the shot, then he got the rebound. Inside Odin. Nice catch. Missed the layup, gets it back, and now a whistle. Let's see. And this will go against Xavier. And Shaw Miller can't believe it. He wanted an over the back foul on Odin, which would have been his third. Odin starting to get real aggressive now. Weak side, dump down, Conley. They throw it inside and <laughs> he almost, almost went in the basket. Almost threw that in the basket. Now Lavender. Even Odin's not that big. Stop and start, Lavender. And a timeout call by Shaw Miller. Dolman getting ready to check back into the game. Ohio State Savior tied up at 35. Welcome back as we take a look at the game summary. Both teams shooting poorly, but we have a close basketball game. Gus Johnson along with Dan Bonner. And these two teams have waited 23 years to play each other. Where they sure have, and I think the weight is more on Xavier's part than Ohio State, the small private school against the big state institution. 
Ohio State stays in the man to man. They've been in man to man and zone. Switching it up. Bowman inside. Can't get the bounce. Odin with the tough rebound. His 10. Now Conley to the bucket. Double clutch. No. Batted around. Dolman kicks it out. Lavender. He's got Raymond with them. Raymond. Beautiful body control. As Lavender puts that one on a dime. Xavier goes up by a deuce. Lewis thinking about it. And hits. Ron Lewis is a ball player. 38-37. He has 12. Gus, you said it correctly. You could see clearly he was thinking about it. The defense has to get out there and make him drive. He can do that pretty well, by the way, but you don't want to give him that wide open three. Dolman looking for it in the corner, has it. Nice look, Cole. Block from behind. Who's that? And the foul is going to go on Hunter, his second. Odin has two. Hunter now with two. As Brandon Cole goes to the line, he's a 69% free throw shooter. He entered the starting lineup for the final 12 games after Josh Duncan injured his ankle. And this team became a different team when he became a starter. What happened was... When Cole's in the game, he's basically down on the inside. Duncan is a guy who likes to come out to the perimeter, so with Cole in the game, Xavier has more space out on the perimeter, allowed the other guys to get in spots to shoot, drive it to the basket. They just play a little bit better as a team when he's in the game. Duncan's a shooter. Cole, a totally different player. He rebounds, defends, and bangs you in there. Ten lead changes, three ties in this one. 39-38, Xavier. Keep in mind that Dolman has three fouls and Xavier can't afford to have him get four. Traveling violation on Odin. Gusson, as we watch the Ohio State bench, they hold up signs to call the plays, but interestingly enough, they angle them away from the Xavier bench because these coaches know one another very well. They don't want the Xavier guys to see the terminology that they're using. The game within the game. Sean Miller said it best, we're like mirrors of each, of each other. Except for one thing, that big guy in the middle. I think Xavier's gonna need to get some offense from Burrell. Here's Lavender, penetrating. Fires. Knocked out of bounds, will head the other way. John Cal, Les Jones, Mike Wood. The three officials. Pick and roll Lewis with Odin. Lewis crosses over and a foul. Reach in coming up. Had he not reached in his hand, he was going to get a charge. Cage called for the foul. That is his first in the team six. And don't forget, coming up next, Butler, Maryland. That's a good one, a 4-5. And then Rick Pitino and the Cardinals against Billy Gillespie's Aggies from Texas A&M. That one could be brutal. Pitino's team doing such a nice job in the first round against Stanford, pressing Lewis. The scoop, Dolman clears it. That's a good one-on-one -on -one matchup for Ohio State out on the perimeter. Lewis can take Cage. He just didn't finish. Now Lavender guarded by Conley. Still no points from the starting Xavier backcourt. Duncan wide open. Short. Butler. Houghton. And one. <laughs> 11 50 to play in the second half. Ohio State takes a 40-39 lead. Greg Oden going to the free throw line right after this.
Aerial coverage of today's game is brought to you by Goodyear. 40-39, Ohio State with the lead over Xavier. 11.50 to play in the second half. Drew Lavender had 17 points, five assists, four rebounds, and three turnovers against BYU on Thursday. He had two points at halftime, Dan. He came out in the second half and really got his game going. Right now, he's scoreless. Gustin, I thought that was a key factor in the game. That, But what he was able to do in that second half the other night against BYU is take the ball down into the lane and score on those little runners, and he hasn't even attempted that with Odin standing there in the middle. Gage. What a great job by Conley to come over and help. Dolman kicks it down. Duncan's got to hit some and does. Duncan's going to be wide open for that. On dribble penetration, he has nine, three threes. And Xavier reclaims the lead, 42-41. He's the kid that hit the big shot against BYU to give Xavier the lead late in the game. Xavier stays in the man-to-man. -man. Here's that matchup we talked about, Lewis against Kane. Dolman tracks it down on the Lewis miss. Here comes Lavender. Leaves it, Dolman lets it go. Duncan with the rebound. And he's fouled. You can still have dribble penetration and draw the defense even without shooting the ball against Duncan, and that's exactly what happened there. Dolman takes it in, the defense comes to him, and he passes it out to Duncan. You know, with Odin in the middle, I don't know why the defense would collapse that much. That's a good point. Third foul on Hunter. In the backcourt is Lavender. Lavender, Duncan, Cage, Dolman, Burrell. Xavier still not getting anything from Burrell. But you get the feeling that before this game is over, he's going to hit a big shot or two. Now Ohio State goes small. Cage exploding on the baseline and goes right through Odin. That's a nice move by Cage. Takes him outside and drives to the baseline. Lighty has come in the game, and Hunter has gone out because Dad Mata trying to find a way to guard both Dolman and Duncan. Doesn't want those three-point shots. Xavier said they wanted Ohio State. And a foul. Offensive foul against Odin. His third. Do you leave him in? You, I, well, I think at this point in the game, he can come out for a couple seconds. But you talk about sticking your nose in there. Duncan sticks his nose right into Odin's elbow and picks up the foul call. Now let's see if Xavier attacks Odin now that he has three fouls. Lavender, Cage, takes a jump shot. And hits! Xavier said they wanted Ohio State. They've waited 23 years. Space and opportunity is here right now. Largest lead of the game. 47-41 at Rupp. 9.53 to play. Nice. 47-41, Xavier a nine against Ohio State. The top seed in the South, Sean Miller. And Thad Mata are best friends. Miller replaced Mata when he left Xavier to take the Ohio State job. The Xavier fans don't like Mata anymore because he said he was staying on one night and the next night he took the job at Ohio State. They want revenge. And right now, with 9.53 to play in the second half, Xavier leads it 47 to 41. And Thad Mata shown a lot of confidence in his young big man as he Roden went back out on the court. Thad Mata showed, told him, you have three fouls. Now Conley spins, lost it. Buckeyes getting tight. 11 turnovers. Pick and roll Lavender. Cage has been terrific. Trying to isolate him on the, on the side against Odin. Cage pops out. Odin has three fouls. Dolman goes up high, and Lewis ties him up. The possession arrow favors Xavier. Boy, Thad Marta's head, or his, uh, his heart had to be right up in his mouth there. As we take a look at the series history, this is the fourth meeting. First meeting in 1933, last meeting in 1984.
9.08 to play, second half. Xavier with a 47-41 lead. Tomorrow on 60 Minutes, Simon Cowell can dish it out on American Idol, but can he take it? Watch him get a dose of his own medicine. Followed by new episodes of The Amazing Race All-Stars, Cold Case and Without a Trace. Tomorrow on CBS, America's number one network. And I think Cage has done a great job of taking Odin out to the perimeter and making him use his feet to play defense. I think if he'd have pushed through, he might have gotten a foul on Odin there. In the corner, Duncan! Josh Duncan. A two-point field goal. 49-41 Xavier. They only had five seconds left on the shot clock. They had to get something quickly, and they did. Lewis pulls up for three. And answers. Cold-blooded ball player. Veteran ball player, Ohio State. A lot of young guys out there, but Butler and Lewis are the two veterans. Lewis with 15. Lavender. Guarded by Lighty now. Well, Duncan's mismatched against Conley inside. Cage taking Odin off the dribble. Step back, jump shot. Oh, my goodness. 8-14 to play second half. And suddenly, Gus, it's raining three-point baskets for Xavier. You knew they eventually would start hitting shots. Ohio State has to respond, though. And the man to do it usually is Butler, and he travels. 7.54 to play. Xavier asked for it. They wanted it. They're getting it. We talked about the X factor being three veterans and three point shots. Well, one of those veterans is Justin Cage, and he has hit three three-point baskets in the second half to lead Xavier to this eight-point lead. Seven of seven overall, three of three from beyond the arc. In the second half, Xavier is 10 of 18 from the field. Ohio State, five of 16. Now Dolman, along with Lavender. Cage, Cole, and Burrell. High State stays with the small lineup, and they need to use the small lineup to put more pressure on the basketball. Eight to shoot. Lavender has to hurry now. Four to shoot. Lavender, fall away. Got it! Woo! Fifty-five, forty-four. Xavier. Largest lead of the game. So the number one team in the country, the number one team in the South is on the ropes. We'll see what they're made of right now. Lewis, short, Oden with the rebound, and he sticks it in. There's plenty of time left. Ohio State does not need to force shots like that one. The big guy inside, throw him the ball. They didn't throw it to him. He went to get it himself and score. Here comes little Drew Lavender from Columbus, Ohio. Dolman, senior. Now you don't want to lose your aggressiveness here if you're Xavier. You want to keep attacking. Take good shots. They work the shot clock down. Pick and roll. Lavender, stop and start. Inside, Cole. Lost it. Picked up. Conley leaves it for Butler. 55-48. John Miller tells his guys just to calm down. They want to run their offense. It's too early to start running time off the clock. Inside, nice catch. And a whistle and foul on the floor. Lighty, foul. Drew Lavender, this is with uh, no time left on the shot clock, and he just drills it from three. His first basket of the game, and Greg Oden can't get the ball in the set offense, so he just with three guys around his feet. What a play that is. Grabs Lavender, the rebound, puts it in. Unbelievable balance to gather himself off the jump off the dribble, rather, and knock down that jump shot. Burrell fires a three. And Lewis with the rebound. 
Here comes Lewis. He's been their offensive leader this afternoon. Connolly, Butler, Cook, deep in the corner. Gus, I really think in this situation, Odin needs to touch it every time down. He doesn't need to shoot every time down, but he draws such attention inside. You have to throw him the ball. That'll give you more, opening more openings for shots. Buckeyes have lost three games this season. North Carolina without Odin, Florida, and Wisconsin all on the road. Morrell. Cage steps back. Now gets to the bucket and a foul. He's been doing it all afternoon, and that's the fourth foul on Odin with five minutes to go. And now he has to sit. Xavier is doing a great job spreading the court out, getting Odin in isolation situations against Cage. That time, Cage did follow through. He didn't stop, and as a result, he draws the fourth foul. They finally get the ball in Cage's hand, and he just keeps going. He feels that contact. That was a great job to follow through. Even though he had that shot, had no chance of going in. You've got to force the referee to blow the whistle in that situation. So Thad Mata not substituting, and he's going to leave Greg Oden in the game. 20 points for Cage. Cuts the call for Mata. 57-48. Connolly. They're looking inside. For Odin, he has it, drop step, and he's fouled. And that is why Thad Mata left him in the game. He's confident that his big man can be careful on the defensive end, but on the offensive end, he needs him inside so they can throw him the ball. He can't guard Cage anymore, though. Because Cage knows how to play him. Odin at the line, misses the front end. And Brown breaks it. Now Lavender. Odin is now matched up against Derek Brown. And Sean Miller calls a timeout. 4.31 to play second half. Xavier with a 57-48 lead. Welcome back. Don't forget, coming up, another great matchup. Four versus a five. Maryland and Butler then later on here. Louisville and Texas A&M a three versus a six. Greg Oden comes back onto the floor. He has four fouls. Xavier with the 57-48 lead. And Coach Sean Miller has gotten great performances from some unsung guys. Cage only averages 10 points. He has 18. Duncan has hit three threes. Make that 20 points, rather, for Cage. And during that timeout, Brown went out, Duncan came in, so now Odin has to guard an offensive threat on the perimeter. Lavender, top of the key. Rebounded by Lewis. No need for Ohio State to panic. They've got plenty of time, but they have to start getting good shots on offense. Lewis banks one in high. He has been awesome. 17 points and a timeout called by the Buckeyes. 57-50, Ron Lewis driving. Fifty-seven fifty. Xavier with the lead. And it's an Ohio State team as you get a look at Sean Miller's bride sitting there in the stands. Look of concern on her face. And then to Thad Mata. Xavier needs to run its offense. There's still too much time left in the game to be worried about running time off the shot clock. You don't take bad shots, but you take the good shots that are available. Now, a very small lineup in the game for Ohio State. Morrell driving inside, got it up and in. And that is the first basket of the NCAA tournament for Burrell. And what a smart play by Burrell. Not only is Odin not in the game, there are no big guys in the game. And so he hasn't shot it well from outside, so he just takes it all the way to the goal. Connolly in the corner, Cook gets to the bucket, left-hand scoop, no. And Lavender gets the rebound. Lavender so cool, calm, slick with the basketball. 
Got to force the tempo on defense if you're Ohio State now. You've got that. You've got five small guys in the game, so you've got to exert pressure on the basketball. Abner pulls it back, ten to shoot. You go inside against this lineup. Five to shoot. Three to shoot. Lavender double clutch. Lewis with the rebound. And he's fouled, bringing it up the floor. And Burrell has not scored a basket in this tournament. And that's an awfully big one for number one. Xavier with a 59-50 lead and a win today over Ohio State would be a big, big, big one. Obviously, there's a lot of bad blood, not between the players and him, but between the fans and, you know, Thad Mott and how he left and whatnot. So I, I know for a fact it'll mean the world to them if we can go out there and, and, and knock off Ohio State. Right now, they're doing it. Two minutes and 54 seconds away, Thad Mata left Xavier. The reason that the bad blood is there, because one night he said he was staying. The next night he was the head coach of the Buckeyes of Ohio State. After leading the team to the Elite Eight, Lewis at the line. Sean Miller is his best friend. In the press conference yesterday, he said, Sean Miller, great coaches leave this program, and we've had some great coaches here. Yes, and I think that's the important point about Thad Mata. You talk about the fans being upset with him. He didn't exactly leave the covered bear. He left some good players and a great coach there. Yeah, damn, but he went to Ohio State. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> that's the problem. 59-52. An eternity remaining in this game. Ohio State with some pressure. Musketeers have to continue to make plays. Greg Oden is back in the game, playing with five fouls. Excuse me, four fouls. Goldman down the lane. Oden with the rebound. Boy, what a good play by Oden to pressure that ball without committing that fifth foul. He has 12 rebounds. Ah, Lewis. Kicks it out. Butler from the parking lot. And a steal. Connolly. Ohio State with another chance. Under two minutes to play. Lewis. <laughs> he thought about it. His confidence is sky high right now. Lewis doesn't want to give it up. Cook. It's been tough going for the freshman all day. Now Lewis takes a look. Down the lane, Lewis up, and one! Ron Lewis refusing to let his team down. What an outstanding play by Lewis. Just puts his head down, gets his shoulders around, goes all the way to the goal. The veteran has been making plays all day long, none bigger than the last couple. Free throw is up and in. Ohio State rallying. 59-58, 1.35 to play. The battle for Ohio. 23,000 at Ruff. The winner advancing to the Sweet 16. Who wants the ball now? Cage with 20 points, and he's fouled on the baseline. That was a great move by Cage, but did you see how fast Odin came? So Cage will go to the line, Cook call for the foul, and shoot two. Cook picks up his second. Cole ready to check in. Cage, 20 points, 3 of 4 from the free throw line. Remember what we said earlier in the game, Gus. Xavier does a great job from the free throw line. They don't mind being there with the game on the line. 8 of 11 today. Second free throw, Cage. Got it. Senior from that town. 61-58. Here's must, Conley. Must score situation for Ohio State. 
Butler inside. Connolly for three. Rims off. Losing a foul. Good call on the baseline. Cole. Clip Greg Oden. Conley is not one of the guys you'd normally want taking that three, but what a great job by Odin working the position inside. Cole grabs onto him now. Odin has to make the free throws. Shooting with his right hand. <laughs> Missed his last two. Xavier, 59.5 seconds away. Ohio State, the number one team in the country on an 18-game winning streak. Second free throw, good. Full court pressure now. Lavender has been excellent with the basketball. You have time to get a stop without a foul. Burrell, skip pass. Dolman in no man's land and a 20 and a timeout rather called. By Xavier, 43.3 remaining, 61-59. Back after this. Welcome back, welcome back to Bracket in the South. Ohio State Xavier, the winner advancing to the Sweet 16. 61-59 our score. Sean Miller, who was a great player at Pittsburgh, played with Charles Smith and Jerome Lane. He was a point guard as you take a look at the game reset. Xavier out of timeouts. Interesting thing for Xavier, the worst free throw shooter on the court for Xavier shoots 75%. So if you're Ohio State, you don't want to foul. Lavender, 10 to shoot. Duncan, spinning. Duncan inside, lost it, taken away by Oak. Ohio State with a chance. 61-59, Lewis, shot clock turned off. Lewis, drives baseline, kicks it out. Butler for the die, no. Loose, inside Lighty, no call. Ten seconds to go to foul. And Cage will go to the line. Odin picks up his fifth foul. That's a good look, and what a scramble underneath the basket. Lighty, I think, just lost his footing on the inside. Odin had really no choice at that point. Wow. Big free throws here, though. 9.3 to go. Odin fouls out. 14 points, 12 rebounds. Xavier did a really nice job defensively, Gus, preventing the dribble penetration. And they've done a great job defensively the entire game. They held Ohio State to 35% in the first half. The Buckeyes just a little bit better than that in the second half. That is a full timeout. We'll take a timeout. 9.3 to go. 61-59. 61-59. Xavier, 9.3 seconds away from advancing to the Sweet 16, and they send their senior to the line, looking to ice this game. Justin Cage, 5 of 6 from the three-point line this afternoon. He has 22 points. Sean's wife takes a deep breath. Ohio State still has time. They've got their four best three-point shooters in the game. And he missed it. Got to hurry. Connolly, five to go. Lewis has been awesome. Let's it go. It go. He ties it at 62. Two seconds to go. Lavender, three-quarter court. And we're going to overtime in Lexington. Ha-ha! <laughs> College 
basketball. CBS Sports. This is March Madness. They've got their four best three-point shooters in the game. Some screens, Gus, but that is a long, long three-point basket. And Lewis is the guy who has made plays down at the end of the game. He's helped bring them back, and he ties the game. Sean Miller. Wow. Ron Lewis refusing to let his team lose. We're heading for an extra one here at Ruff. Ron Lewis, the senior from Columbus, Ohio, hits the biggest shot of his career. And Lewis, this gives, these are points 23, 24, and 25. What an outstanding afternoon he's had. But now Ohio State gets new life, but they'll have to do it without one of their best players. Greg Oden has fouled out of this game. 62 apiece. And they go with the small lineup once again. Al Dolman off the dribble, rolling, and hits. That's a great decision by Dolman. He's a couple of inches taller than anybody out on the court for Ohio State, and he just takes it to the basket. Ivan Harris. Gus, and isn't it interesting how the advantage as to in terms of perimeter inside-outside has changed with Odin out of the game. Now Xavier's the big team. Conley for three. And he answers. <laughs> Freshman. Sixty-five, sixty-four. We're in overtime. There are 252 three-point baskets out on the court for Ohio State. Xavier coming so close. Burrell. Lost it. Daquan Cook gives it up to Conley. Here come the Buckeyes. They remain cool under pressure. Ron Lewis carried him. Stop and start. Conley, tricky. The veteran gets him into overtime, Gus, and then the freshman scores the first five points of the overtime for Ohio State. How does Xavier respond? 67-64. Lewis hitting that jump shot is almost like getting hit right in the stomach and all the air coming out of him. Absolutely. You figure you have the game won, and particularly since you missed a free throw that gave him the opportunity to do it. But now I think you take the advantage, you take advantage of what works for you. Before it was driving the ball against Odin, now it's taking it inside. Xavier needs leadership. Lavender off the dribble. Outlet pass Conley. Duncan with them. Up and in, Mike Conley Jr. 69-64. He has 17 time out. Xavier. New ball game. Mike Conley Jr. going to work. First he hits a J. Tricks his man to the basket. And then he takes it right at the 6'9 Josh Duncan. Greg Oden is fouled out of this game as you take a look at the game reset. Ohio State with seven unanswered points all coming from freshman Mike Connolly Jr. So Xavier has to figure something out. What Xavier has to do is use their inside advantage. There's still plenty of time left in this game. Now Lavender with Dolman. Dolman trying to post up Lewis. Oh, what, a, what a great play by Lewis. You know, even though you have that inside advantage, if you get good pressure on the ball, it's hard for the guards to find the inside players. Ohio State did a nice job that time. Goldman throws it into the backcourt to Lavender. 69-64. Overtime. Lavender. Guarded by Lewis. Takes them. In the corner, Raymond, short. Weak side rebound goes to Butler. Now the small lineup is going to present some matchup problems for Xavier, but you've got to get a stop. Daquan Cook answers. Huge.
basket for the freshman from Dayton. His first basket of the game. 72-64. And a foul. We talked about all the three-point shooting power in the game. Daquan Cook, he struggled down the stretch of the season, but that is a huge basket right there. And this is what Ohio State has done all season long, Gus, maybe not in as dramatic a fashion as this, but they get themselves in a little bit of a trouble situation, and they hit the gas and go on a spurt. For safety, we're checking at number five, Derek Brown. So Brown comes in and replaces Raymond. And that, that also foul shot right Raymond there, Raymond. Gus breaks a 10-0 Ohio State run. Just when they need it, they pull out the run. Greg Oden on the bench, fouling out. 14 points, 12 rebounds. Burrell. One more free throw. Under two to play. Xavier needs stops. Here's a trap. Connolly in the corner. Cook. Make that Harris. It's going to be hard to trap Connolly. Ball kicked. Shot clock at 19. Now a sub coming in for Xavier. Brandon Cole. Xavier has no choice but to try to exert pressure, but it's going to be tough with Connolly. Winner of this game takes on the winner of Virginia, Tennessee. Conley. Lost it. Picked up Lavender. Lead pass. Dolman. And he'll lay this one in. Seventy two sixty seven and a timeout called by Ohio State. Xavier still playing hard down seventy two to sixty seven. Seventy two sixty seven Ohio State and during the timeout Mike Conley Jr. Had to get a new wheel. <laughs> and that's Amy Miller, Sean Miller's wife. Tells it all right there. Sean continuing to encourage his team on the floor. A lot of time left in this game, 72 to 67. We saw it with Ohio State. Finally, Jr. Lewis, who hit the big three to send it into overtime. 18 on the shot clock. Conley Jr. to the basket and a foul. Overtime has belonged to Mike Conley Jr. Absolutely. He hit the first three baskets of the overtime. They were down by two, and he hits that three, and he drives the ball to the basket, then in transition. This is against a 6'9 player. He lays it in. Gets the first free throw. Mike Conley Jr. now with 18 points. He had 10 at halftime. There's his dad. Coming up 74-67. It's simple for Xavier. They have to score and score quickly. Lavender takes a three. Lewis with the rebound. Well, now you have to think about fouling quickly. Wow. Well, he, he tried to foul him. Knocked away Knocked by him. Goldman. No call. And we'll head the other way. Butler touched it last. Well, these guys are banging at one another. They just ran into each other. The ball had squirted away already at that point. Here's Duncan. Has his shot blocked. Picked up by Daquan Cook. And Lewis is fouled. What a turn of events. Gustin, did you see who blocked that shot? It was Conley. 
Wow. Mike Conley Jr., Xavier, seconds away from heading to the Sweet 16. Somehow, Ohio State managed to dig down deep. And the man at the free throw line right now has been the hero. Ron Lewis with the three-pointer to send it into overtime. Ron Lewis, 26 points with Greg Oden on the bench, fouling out. Second one goes. 29.6 remaining. Lavender. In the corner, Cage. Now Dolman takes a three. Cage with the rebound. 14.6 to go. And a foul. Unbelievable. Wow. As they make the walk to the other end, Thad Mata coaching against his best friend, Shaw Miller. Yesterday he said if they were to lose this game, he'd root for Xavier to go all the way to the Final Four and win the national championship. Ditto for Miller. What a tremendous response by Thad Mata's team, though, Gus. They were down 59-50 to 50 and looked dead. Lazarus. And his name, his first name is Lewis. That's right. <laughs> As Dolman checks out for the final time. Cage checks out for the final time. What a game. Two great careers for these two seniors. Bad Mata can't even watch. He recruited those two young men. And he told us that he would feel badly if they lost the game. Lavender the other way. Tips it up and in with six seconds to go. Butler in the backcourt. Xavier backs off. One of the great comebacks of this year's NCAA tournament. Ohio State survives and advances as the two best friends embrace at center court. 78-71, the final from Ruff. And the Chevrolet players of the game, Justin Cage, the senior, 25 points, 8 of 8 from the field. Ron Lewis, he was money. 78-71 the final. We go back to the end of regulation. And a missed free throw by Xavier gives Ohio State the opportunity for deadly three-point shooters in the game. Lewis takes the long bomb and ties the game. Little weave out at the top. Everybody trying to get to Lewis. They can't do it. A long, long three-point basket. The Ohio State bench reacting to Ron Lewis's game-tying three. Fireworks at Ruff in the heart of college basketball as Ohio State defeats Xavier. Now let's go to Greg Gumbel. All right, Gus, thank you very much. So much to say in so little time, but boy, you heard it. First of all, we knew those Xavier three-point shooters were going to come alive in the Sorry. second half. They did that, and as Dan Bonner said, that one missed free throw changed Ohio State's way of going back at the end of the game. Well, they had an opportunity, and you've got to get an all, give an awful lot of credit to Xavier, but Ohio State made some huge, huge shots, particularly Ron Lewis throughout that comeback from a nine-point deficit with under three minutes to go, and then Conley took over in overtime. A senior hit the big shot for yep. them, and the fact that they played so well in overtime without Greg Oden, that's what championship teams do. All right, we will uh, recap all of this for you coming up in our halftime. And uh, Maryland and Butler are 10-8 now, under 13 minutes in the first half. We're going to take you there. And those of you awaiting the second game in Lexington, Louisville and Texas A&M, they're going to tip at 4:03. If you're slated to see that game, we'll get you there in time for that tip. But meanwhile, we'll send you off to Buffalo after this word from your local station. A couple things. Number one is down the stretch in recent seasons, uh, Michigan had gotten out to good starts, uh, but were not able to close the deal and make runs, which is what the selection committee is looking at, your last 10 games. And in recent years, 
even though Michigan had some good starts both in the non-conference and in the conference schedule, they kind of stumbled down the stretch and that hurt them. And also you're going to be judged by the players you recruited. Now Coach Amaker has had his own generation of recruits that have come of age and he's on now his second generation of recruits in terms of the underclassmen. And if you haven't by your fourth or fifth year started to turn the corner, uh, you may be given one more year. And actually Coach Amaker was given the six years because of the program he inherited that had been hit by the violations and the sanctions. All right, Coach Lavin, indeed, a uh, good take from you today. Tommy Amaker fired at Michigan, Ohio State, an overtime win. The Buckeyes right now at the podium addressing this incredible comeback. Uh, Thad Mata, head coach of Ohio State at the podium. We go there live. And we'd like to open the session up with a uh, statement from Coach Mata. Well, you know, I, I think obviously we're very fortunate to be sitting up here first. Uh, could not be prouder. Of, of, of what these guys did, of, of, of keeping their composure. You know, Xavier went on a blitz there to start the second half. They were making shots. Sean did a phenomenal job of, of moving us around and, and, and really toyed with the matchups. Uh, you know, when Lavender hit that three as the shot clock went off, I, the first time I thought, uh-oh, this isn't good. And, and to these guys' credit, uh, they kept battling. And, and that's kind of been the theme, as I told these guys, we've been here before. And, uh, you know, it's what I love about this team. They, they, they give you, as a coach, a lot of confidence. And, uh, and I kept telling them, keep your confidence and, and make plays. And they did. And we will take your questions for the student athletes. Bob Dunn. Um, Ron, just take us through the, the three to tie the game and uh, also just the overtime. It almost seemed like you guys just relaxed and played. Just uh, first the three and then how you guys played in OT. Well, the three, uh, I was just trying to get an open look. I told Mike before uh, we even left the huddle just to give me the ball. So, uh, and that's what he did. He found me and I had an open look and I took it. Uh, in the overtime, he took uh, everything that they gave him. Mike did. Uh, he he went to the hole. He hit threes and knocked down free throws. Uh, and he see, and he also distributed the rock to uh, players and also knocked down shots. Bob, Mike, what gives this team the composure that Thad uh, spoke of? Um, I'd say it's probably you know how close we've gotten together uh, as a team. Uh, over the year, you know, we've been through a, a lot as a team, and um, you know, any kind of situation you can think of, we've we've been through it as a team right now, and, and um, you know, today was no not, or nothing different. Um, so I think that's just you know part of part of us growing as a team. This end, Mike. When you guys were down by nine points, under three minutes left, what did Coach say to you in the huddle? Well, you know, not to not to try to get you know nine points back in one possession. Uh, you know, take it take it one step at a time. Uh, and not try to force shots. And I think, uh, you know, we did a good job of getting open looks and, and penetrating and, and getting in foul trouble and things like that. And, um, you know, we did a great job of, of stopping them in that, in that little short stretch of, of a run we had. So I think that was uh, the biggest part. Back here. Ron, uh, would you, would you t discuss your uh, conventional three-point play down the stretch and also how, how your game changes uh, if Greg, Greg was not in? He fouled out the first time ever. Uh, the way my game changes when Greg fouls out, uh, we don't have a low presence, which is our our key aspect and our key uh, game plan. So uh, it, it tends for the other players to get aggressive. Uh, and and that's what I did down the stretch. In front. Uh, well, I just try to get the foul. Um, uh, and, and eventually the, the um, I made it. So. I just tried to get the foul, and it went in. Ron, with the future number one NBA draft choice, all these super freshmen coming in, I'm just wondering how many times this year you have said in the huddle, give the ball to me, I want to take the shot. Uh, twice. This and Tennessee. Could you just talk about your role in the team, you know, with, with all these guys coming in? Uh, well, my role is just to um, get these guys together, get them ready for every game, and uh, do what I need to do on the court, uh, rebound, uh, make a shot when I have the open shot, and uh, just keep winning basketball games for this team. Mike, 
Mike, right here. Uh, I'm wondering if the conversation that Ron said he had with you in the huddle, you know, give me the ball, if that's how you remember it and what you, uh, what you thought when he said that and if you indeed look for him instantly. Uh, you know, he was hot this game. He wasn't missing too many shots. And, uh, you know, he had all the confidence in the world. And, and I was going to look for him regardless. But, you know, when he came up to me, you know, it just showed how much confidence he had in his uh, ability. So, I mean, I just, uh, when I got the ball, I tried to look for him uh, as quick as I could. And, and, you know, luckily we got, you know, a, a good shot out of it. Over here. Mike and Jamar, could you both just talk about what you thought when Ron released that shot, if you thought it was in, and, and what that moment is like when, when it goes down? Well, uh, when I saw it in the air, you know, the only thing you could think is you're, you're hoping it's going to go in. And, uh, and when it went through, I knew we had a, you know, a lot of energy and going into the overtime. And uh, you know, I think that really helped us. Yeah, same thing here. I knew we had a lot of confidence. So uh, when he let it loose, you know, I had all the confidence in the world that it was going in. Mike, can you talk about when you see Greg go to the bench with nine seconds left and you're down and then playing the whole overtime without him? Um, you know, we lose a, a big inside presence when he goes out the game. But, um, you know, we've played, you know, seven, seven games without him this year. And uh, as a team, we've, we've learned to play without him sometimes because he gets in foul trouble. You know a lot in the year, so um, I think uh, our team did a great job of, of adjusting and, and adjusting to their roles uh, for those last nine seconds and in the overtime. So I think we did a good job of that. The side, Mike, uh, in the overtime, you've talked before that when Greg goes out, you your mentality sometimes changes. Um, I mean, you scored 11 in the overtime. What was going on? What were you exploiting, and what was uh, right for you offensively there? Um, you know, that that point, you know, I had all the confidence that we would win the game. Um, we had came too far to lose the game, I felt. And, and uh, you know, at that point, I was just trying to take advantage of whatever the defense was giving me and just being a little bit more aggressive than I was in, in the previous 20 minutes of play And because and, I wasn't too aggressive. And, uh, you know, coach told me that before we went out for the overtime. So I just tried to be a, a, as aggressive as I could and get everybody involved. Uh, Coach, were you concerned that Odin uh, might get called? Excuse me. Oh, qu questions for the student athletes first. Questions for the student athletes. Well, I'll wait then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right here, Brian. <clears throat> Mike, what happened to your shoe in the overtime? Uh, it just started falling apart. I don't. <laughs> I don't know what was going on, but it like the. The padding on the bottom just ripped off, and it was just hanging. So, you know, I, I didn't want to trip over myself in a, in a crucial part of the game. So I, uh, you know, I had to tell coach to get me another shoe, or, or call a timeout or something. So they finally, you know, we got a timeout and got the uh, new shoe on. So what happens when you're as fast as he is? <laughs> this side, uh, Mike. When you stole the inbounds pass from Lavender, kind of in the, I don't know, maybe a minute or so to go. Could just what in the heck happened? Um, you know, at that point, we were trying to pressure him full court, and I just decided to deny the ball in bounds because they didn't have anybody else back to um, help, you know, Drew get the ball in bounds. And, and uh, you know, I just tried to anticipate where he's going to throw it. And, uh, you know, luckily, my, I got some long arms, so uh, I reached around and, and tapped it out and, and got, got the ball back. And, uh, you know, I think that helped. Over here. Ron, if you could talk about the, the confidence that a game like this gives you as a team, I mean, knowing that you guys can play for extended time without Greg, what does that do for this team going forward? Uh, uh, it, ne it just gives us no doubt at any point in time in the game. Uh, you know, if Greg goes out, we know we have other scores and other um, options in our uh, on our team. So it just gives us an extra edge and uh, gives us no doubt in our mind that we can still score. And this will be our last question. Jamar, over here. When you had the ball at the end there and you had the three pointer that just rimmed out, I was wondering, did you, what did you think when you took that shot and what did you say to your teammates and what did they say to you after it didn't go in and everything happened there? Uh, when I took the shot, you know, it felt good coming off my hand. Just, uh, you know, it didn't happen to go in. And uh, when we got to that timeout, and, you know, they said, don't worry, you know, we're going to find a way. And we ended up finding a way to take it to overtime. Moments from now, stay here on ESPN News. You'll hear from Ohio State head coach Thad Mata, his team off to the Sweet 16 after overcoming a nine-point deficit. Thanks for watching The Pulse. More news coming up. 
ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. This is ESPN News. Hello, everyone. This is ESPN News. Alongside Steve Lavin, I'm Mark Morgan. You heard Mike Hill's voice moments ago. Mike will join us in just a few moments. Ohio State escapes, and that's the only way to say it. The number one ranked Buckeyes beat Xavier 78-71 in overtime, a thriller. Steve and I will discuss this game in moments, but right now let's hear what Ohio State head coach Thad Mata has to say about his team's win. A team that gets to the Final Four, wins a championship, seems to have a game like this. Are you, are, right now, are you thinking that way? Are you thinking there have been holes poked in you guys since you are number one and trying to get through the bracket? Well, I'm a super positive guy, so I'm saying this is, this is a good thing. Uh, no, I, I think, you know, we knew, quite honestly, when the brackets came up, uh, Xavier was going to be a really, really tough matchup for us. And the reasons why are exactly what you saw today. And, uh, you know, fortunately for us, we were able to, to get through it. Okay, we'll get. As I was saying, <laughs> <laughs> Coach, uh, from where you sat, how did you see the last foul on Odin? And were you at all concerned that it might be called an intentional foul? Uh, no, I thought we got fouled uh, on, the, on the putback. I, that's what I thought the whistle was. I was like, we're shooting free throws. This is great. Um, but I think it was more after, afterwards. Uh, but, you know, it was one of those plays, and, and uh, you know, I, I, Greg's aggressive, and, and I want him to be aggressive. This side. Coach, I'm just wondering, in a game like this, uh, especially given how much you and Coach Miller are friends, if you, I mean, I know you're thrilled to advance, but mm -hmm. how much of you is like dying for the other guy in a game like this? And also just the job he's done at Xavier and, oh. uh, go, and going forward. Well, I think um, this, this was a very, very difficult game to, to coach. And, and um, you know, from the standpoint that, that I'm as, as happy as I've ever been, but I'm as sad as I've ever been. You know, when, when you work with people, you know, from, from Todd Licklider to, to Sean Miller, I mean, I couldn't be happier that two of our guys are, are in our family are in the sweet six, are in the round of 32. And, um, you know, my, I, I feel bad that, uh, you know, I, I was there for those guys' first college game ever. And therefore, the last one, I mean, you think of the irony in all of it. And, and you know, you, you talk about the job Sean Miller's done. I mean, it is, it is incredible. Uh, I've said this from the first time I ever met him back as an assistant coach at Miami. Wow, I think he's one of the best coaches in the country. He's taught me everything I know about recruiting. Uh, you know, he and I used to live like a mile apart when we were in, in Cincinnati, and we'd ride to work together. And, uh, you know, was, with the traffic down there, it was about a four-hour drive both ways. And, um, you know, and, and I think Sean's one of those guys that, that you know, he's going to be put in a situation of, of, that I was in. And, and, and I think that, you know, the, the thing with Xavier, it is a great program. And, and um, you know, but make no mistake about it, he's, he's going to have options just like I did. And, and I think that, you know, the big thing for them is, is to put him in a position because Xavier is a big time program. Uh, but, you know, he sits in the middle of the pack in the Atlantic 10. And, and his expectations are, believe me, I know you better win every damn game and get to the final four. And uh, so hopefully at the, when they get back, they're going to take great care of him. In the back here. Uh, coach, uh, first half, uh, you went to the zone defense uh, for an extended period of time. Was that because of foul problems with Lewis on the bench with two? And maybe you wanted to, to, to stretch it as far as you could at the same time it seemed to keep Xavier in contact with you and maybe you had a chance to kind of. Well, uh, the, the reason we played the zone was we knew that they were going to do what they did in the second half when we went man to man. And, and that was the pick and pop stuff. And, and uh, you know, our big thing going in this game, we told our guys, you got to do two things. You got to keep them off the foul line. And you can't give them threes. And, uh, you know, for them, eight for 23 and, and 11 to 16 from the line, uh, you know, I think that was one of the, the big keys to the game. And, and we wanted to get them on the boards. And, and, and fortunately for us, we got all three of them today. In front. 
that uh, Ron Lewis has had the audacity to take up a scholarship for four years at two different <laughs> schools. Uh, in this day and age, what what kind of pl uh, what's he meant for you, and what's been his role with all these freshmen coming in and all these other guys that he had yeah. to shepherd? I guess. Well, you know, it's funny with Ron. Uh, you know, as your mind goes back, when we went to Ohio State, it was in the middle of the recruiting period. All the, the guys, you know, we, we signed three guys that year. Ron was one of them. The other two guys are gone. We didn't obviously know enough about them, and, and they've transferred. So he's the only standby from the first class we ever brought in. And quite honestly, he showed up on our doorstep. I, I didn't know anything about Ron. And uh, he, a uh, fax came through that, that said he was transferring, and, and we started kind of checking around, and they said, you know, he's a pretty good player, and, um, you know, Thank goodness he, he showed up because uh, I think that he's played himself into position and, and we've told him all year long, I think he's one of the better guards in the country. And uh, the, the leadership that he has provided has, has been, especially down the stretch, I, I can't explain it to you. Him in the Big Ten tournament last weekend and timeouts in the locker room, uh, I'd never seen it as consistent. I mean, he'd do it at times, but it was it was just off the charts. Even today, um, you know, coaching in the timeouts, telling guys they're they're picking here, they're doing this, we're switching this, and um, couldn't be happier for him. And you know what? And he graduates tomorrow. That's that's the other thing that I love. Yeah. Bob here in the middle. Thad, you, you mentioned um, the reason you went man to man was because of the. Um, the pick and pop. They were hitting threes. Their big guys were hitting threes on you even when you were still in the zone. Did you go small eventually because you just needed to, no matter how big he was, you just needed to get a hand in somebody's face to defend the three? Yes, yeah. And, and uh, you know, as, as we thought, the, the reason we opened in the zone, you know, and, and, and Duncan had two threes and the one right in front of our bench in the first half, I thought Othello almost got a piece of it. He had, he had a great challenge. You know, they were two for nine at halftime and we're saying this is perfect. And, and the, the one thing, we missed so many easy shots in the first half. It was, I mean, we were right around the basket. I, I told the guys, you know, we got to put it in. And then, you know, it, it, was, it was difficult. And, and Sean did a tremendous job with his own offense because they put Dolman in there. And, and, and I, I think Justin's one of the best players in the country because of his size, his savvy, his passing ability, and his shooting ability. And, uh, and, and he got in there and was like, you know, John Stockton in the middle of it. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, Justin Cage had made 10 